It's time for Supply Chain Now, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton, Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to today's show. Greg, we have got a great follow-up episode to one we, we, that we published with a, a great friend of the show just a couple weeks ago. Are you ready? I'm ready. I love talking about sweet, honey sweet <laughs> citrus, man. So yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Let's do this. Well, today's uh, show continues. This little mini series we're doing all about the produce supply chain. And we've yeah. got two incredible leaders in that space. So uh, I bet our audience is going to learn something new about it, whether it's citrus supply chain, the produce industry, you name it, because we got two pros to know. So stay tuned. We're working hard to increase your supply chain IQ. More to come on that in just a moment. But hey, a quick programming note. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check us out wherever you get your podcast from and subscribe so you won't miss great shows just like this one. We've got two outstanding guests. All right. So Greg, we're ready to introduce our featured guests here today. Yeah, let's do it. You want me you to do it? it? Uh, I'll Come do it. On. What? <laughs> well, we've got a trailblazer. Uh, so yeah. our first guest we want to yes. introduce is Patrick Kelly, host of the, the Produce Industry Podcast. Patrick, how you doing? Hey, hey, guys. Awesome. Doing fantastic as always. Well, Good to have you, man. We love what you do. We love the passion that you do it with. And I can I can watch it uh, with your your Apple video episodes. I mean, it, it, there's something captivating about it. Uh, and and you also all, always offer a different spin, you know, from from either a scientific or a technical standpoint, or you name it. But love what you do, and and love to have you here on Supply Chain now. But you brought a special guest with you. Yeah, yes, I did. So along with Patrick, we have Michael Chavez, Vice President at Gold Star Citrus. Hey, you doing, Mike? All good. Uh, the good old golden star is just shining over here. So glad to be on with you gentlemen again. Yeah. Awesome. Love yeah. That. So I don't know if everybody knows the history, but we have been on the produce podcast, the produce the. podcast, kind of like the Ohio state university. So, uh. Uh, so um, we've actually met sort of right. Uh, Patrick and, and Michael before it was a great discussion, by the way, listen up because uh, we got some really cool insights there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and you can check that out. Patrick, well, before we dive into the episode here today, where can folks find that podcast and all of your episodes? Yeah, so if you want to go straight to the produceindustrypodcast.com and go to the episodes page, you can check out all the episodes there. Uh, as well, we're on Anchor, Spotify, and Apple, where you can find all your podcasts. All right. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So with no further ado, let's jump right in. And before we get into industry and work and, and the hard stuff, let's get to know both of y'all a little bit better and introduce you to our audiences. So let's start with you, Patrick. So tell us, you know, tell us where you're from and give us the goods on your upbringing a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So I'm from Orange, California. I was born and raised in Orange, California. I uh, grew up in San Diego. Dad had a little half acre, uh, acre of some avocados, a lemon tree and some kumquats. And, you know, that really got us started in the produce industry. My dad was always involved with retail, uh, produce, supply chain, uh, the juice industry as well. So as a young kid, I always really fathered my, fathered, followed my father's footsteps. I've got pictures of me as a young kid in these lemon trees. I've got pictures of me uh, with my dad's suitcase, right? I got the tie on. I got the, uh, the cap on, walking around in dad's <laughs> shoes. You know, and I always thought I was going to be part of, of this business uh, environment. I never thought I was going to be involved in produce. As a young kid, dad was always in the fields and on the horizon. As I say, he was always making deals with growers, making uh, fruit for processing for juice. And, you know, I really kicked off my career when I moved back out to California. Um, I would say when I was around 18 to 20 years old, about 2005, I uh, started working for Laboo's subsidiary company, Laboo Citrus, which was a, a longstanding citrus uh, packing house and grower in the Central Valley, over 80 years in business. Mm -hmm. um, started working with them really from the field level as a manager and training, worked my way all the way up from 
being on the pack line, you know, spraying pesticides in the fields, driving the forklifts, uh, really got a taste of it. And then in 2010, uh, I had this real urge to start my own business. Uh, my dad and I, my dad being a baby boomer, myself being a millennial, we had that kind of clash of the cultures. And so I kind of moved on, started my own business in 2010. All right, hang uh, on, hang on, Patrick. I got, I got to interject here. I got to interject because yeah. when you describe that clash of cultures or clash of generations, I think we've all experienced that. Is there one thing, one tactical or simple thing that you and your dad had a different view on in the business? You know, actually, it was our business mannerisms, 100%. I mean, it was how we conducted ourselves in the industry. He was night and I was day. And it was just like some people love dealing with me. Some people love dealing with him. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, ready? Mike's going to laugh at this, but he was the president. <laughs> so he was the title. And Mike, that's why yep. I'm scared of this title. But he was the one in charge, you know, pulling the strings. And at that point, um, I felt that I could make my own, pave my own way and do my own things. And I, and I did, and we did it successfully uh, for, you know, a few years uh, until I went to work for a corporate uh, job, which we've talked about in the past, a uh, publicly traded company in the 3PL world, C.H. Robinson, um, did a stint with them for a few years. Um, and then, yeah, I've always been involved in, you know, entrepreneurship, uh, creating new businesses. And then today I own my own consulting company. Um, that I do different consulting for, for different firms, different organizations in the produce and supply chain industry now, uh, which has the podcast and many other, other things underneath that. Hmm. All right. So Greg, I'm going to let you unpack that journey, which Patrick does a great job of making it succinct in a nutshell, but we're going to unpack that a little bit. Um, so before I switch over to Mike, Patrick, give me one other, I, I can envision that, ha I think you called it a half acre plot of land with avocados that le a single lemon tree which single i love lemon tree. and the kumquats what else really sticks out it, it, you know when you were a kid or as you're coming of age is there one other thing that you really love to do with, either with your father or related to the produce industry that you're so passionate about you know what's funny is and i talk about this with my brothers as well is my mom was always a stay-at-home mom but when i remember when i was a kid like uh, like i say toddler I remember my mom used to work at this fresh produce stand. Uh, I don't remember the name and my, my, my mom remembers because we've talked about it, but I remember going down to the fresh produce stand and getting lemonade. You know, remember those icy lemonades you used to get when oh, we were yeah. kids? They don't do them like they did when we were kids. Like they, they got more preservatives in them now. Mm. Um, but I do remember always going down there and I remember my mom working part-time there and I just remember seeing all the fresh produce and seeing these, these pop-up shops and I, and I loved it. And then being with my dad, I remember if you've ever been to a juice plant, you know the disgusting, rotting smell of oranges at a juice plant. Mike knows it. We, listen, it, trust me, if you've smelt it, it's just fermented fruit. Mm -hmm. But I smelt that as a kid. And I remember even when my dad would bring home orange juice, I'd be like, oh, here we go again, right? Mm -hmm. So it just, it was always in my head. My dad was always bringing home samples, always bringing home these things. And it was like, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And leading into this day, Mike, um, my kids have been to Michael's Packing House probably over six dozen times, both awesome. of my kids. And to this day, they know who Mike Chavez is. He's the guy with the citrus packing house. <laughs> and my kids know to this day what dad does. And I think that they're going to be inspired to work in this industry um, if they choose to as well. I love that. All yeah. right. So, Mike, uh, one of the things you mentioned, um, talking about that, that, that family connection, uh, we interviewed a diplomat from Canada. Uh, she's the yeah. consul general of uh, Canada in Atlanta. She's transitioning to a new role by the time this probably comes out but consul general theodore and one of her favorite memories as a kid was her father taking her through the produce section and asking her if she knew where this comes from or where this comes from and it was just a a, a very visual moment a very vivid part of that interview but we all make these connections and and, and fruit and produce produce the you know fruit and vegetables there's such a story to tell behind every single variety every single type and uh, that's what I love about these conversations we have with both of y'all. So, all right. So, Mike, you're not getting out of this uh, as we get to know you better and, and share you with our audience. So, tell us, Mike, before we start getting into your professional journey and, and the business side, you know, where did you grow up? Where, where are you from? And, and give us the same thing that Patrick shared. Give us the goods on your upbringing a little bit. Gotcha. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Glad to be on. Um, started my journey in Cutler, Rosie, Little Town. 
here in the Central Valley, uh, a lot of farming, uh, a lot of agriculture. Uh, so grew up with uh, my family being citrus growers. So, you know, first job was, you know, out there in the in the uh, fields, checking water lines, wrapping trees on a, on a uh, parcel of land we still have um, with, uh, you know, wraps and all that good stuff for new planning. So very much like Patrick's upbringing, you know, grew up in a rural area, you know, started working young, of course, saw dad, you know, running his packing house and his packing operation, as well as the farming side. So uh, started on the farming side in the field and then graduated to the packing house. That was a big deal. At about 13, I got to go into the packing house. So that was, that was nice. And then uh, went off to uh, Fresno State for college. And, uh, you know, I know Patrick's a Bulldog alumni. We're both very proud Bulldog alumni. Mm. Uh, a lot of ag, a lot of ag support out of that school. I mean, it's a great, great, uh, great institution. And then uh, worked for a buying company uh, in Fresno for uh, two and a half years. All so right. that, uh, that was a big experience for me coming from a small family grower packer to a, uh, you know, uh, very big, uh, I think mm. they were number one or number two procurement size office, wow. you know, throughout the United States. So it, it was a big, it was a big shift for me. And it was a lot of a lot of learning, uh, learning quick. So that, that was interesting. <laughs> All right. So before we toss over to Greg and we dive a little deeper in the, in the professional side, let's back up a minute because you were talking about graduating to the packing house and that was a big deal. What, uh, why was it such a big deal? Big deal. I mean, you're out in the field, you know, there, there's uh, you got to go down the road. Luckily we were about three miles from our home. So if we had to use, you know, the restroom or go grab a snack, like any 11 or 12 year old, you know, we could go and see what mom had going in the kitchen. But uh, yeah, it, it was, it was tough. You're in the, you're in the heat, you know, the Valley here, you, a lot of days at a hundred degrees. So, I mean, you are working, you know, in some pretty, uh, pretty hot weather. You mm -hmm. try and start early and then you got to get done by a certain, you know, once we hit a temp, uh, a certain temperature trigger, but uh, yeah, going into the packing house uh, took some time. I had to work two summers out in the fields, you know, mm. dad wanted me to be out there. And when I got to go into the packing house, you're at least in a building in a facility. And, you know, it, it was kind of a promotion, I guess I would say to me, at least in my eyes at that time. <laughs> you went from right. grunt to executive almost. I'm sure it felt <laughs> executive like grunt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> executive oh, yeah. grunt. All right. Well, one final question I've got is, so y'all both went to and attended uh, the home of the Bulldogs, right? Fresno State. Um, did, is that where y'all met initially? No. Okay. All right. Well, then what's, so what's one of your favorite memories of, of attending Fresno State? What, what's something that's really unique about the school, the campus, the tradition? What would that be? And, and Mike or Patrick, whoever wants to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, one of the things for me is I studied for my undergrad and my MBA there. And uh, they really merged the international programs together. So I did part of my uh, master's program hmm. at Hong Kong Baptist University, wow. studied international business over there with Tom Burns and a select group of people like with the executive master's and business uh, association degree. Wow. And that was one thing that really opened my eyes on um, the first trip out of the country besides Canada and Mexico uh, was me going and living in China for six, seven weeks and doing schooling. And I'll tell you what, it opened my eyes. I told myself when I left China um, in 2012, I will never go back to China again. Mm. And now it's 2020. Um, if I was to show you my passport, I've probably been to China at least six or seven times <laughs> since 2012. And, and even Mike knows since then, it's just opened me up so much to the global economy. And Fresno State really did that for me. Mm. Awesome, man. That, that is, is great. Testimony. Yeah. I thought, you know, I, I immediately went to Jerry Tarkanian. Uh, and, and how that legend, basketball legend went to Fresno State after UNLV, right? Um, all right. I was Mike. thinking football because they have a hell of a football. Probably, yeah. I, I was going to go really <laughs> simple. Patrick went really <laughs> high end on us. <laughs> so, well, Mike, I was going to say the football games were the most memorable. That's what I remember the most. <laughs> Man, all right. I mean, that's as valuable as anything else, really, um, because you guys stomped the guts out of some highbrow teams. So, mm -hmm. It's good to have those kind of memories. Agreed. As well, right? Agreed. You got to, you know, got to balance. I went to three games my entire Bulldog uh, season to, or career, I would say. But 
you know, I you also were have clearly my, hanging out with the wrong people. Yeah, you know, well, no, my son went, so I started college late. I took me like 12 years to get through college, but I had my son when I was going to Fresno State. Oh, so God. I had, I had just different priorities at the time and, and things like that. I was trying, I, listen, I was hustling, making money, and trying to support a family as a, as a 20, 25, 26 year old. Wow. Yeah. All right. So, Greg, let's, let's dive more into the, the yeah. business stuff. Yeah. So, it's interesting that both of you have the kind of family business story. But I'd love to start with Michael and, you know, prior to what you're doing now, let's say after the last football game at Fresno State, give us a little bit of an idea of, of how your, you know, of your professional journey to, it may even be at the, the family business, but at least until you got into this position as vice president. Uh, it was a, it was a big shift kind of, so to speak, after, you know, doing the tailgates and the party ending in that arena um you know it was a big uh, shock for me i went to work uh for the kroger company in their buying office and i mean you're dealing with the biggest players in every item whether it's head lettuce oranges i only knew oranges you know stone for you go down that produce aisle you know i i still think of things this way i see labels where i can tie them to either representatives hey that's my buddy jeremy hey that's dennis that's so and so <laughs> you know, you see this label, even if it's cutie label, oh, that's Uncle Barney, I like to call him, you know, but, uh, you know, you see these labels and you build these relationships. And I think that's a big part of, you know, my learning curve there during the procurement years, I spent two and a half years there doing that, building these relationships, you know, with companies that were just, you can't even fathom the volume and the level that they're, you know, operating at. And then deciding to come back home to the family, the family business and, basically starting from scratch, you know, you try and learn what, uh, what the big guys do, uh, hopefully, you know, grasp the good as well as the bad so you can avoid any pitfalls. And, um, you know, that was in 2012 when I came back with, uh, with Golden Star and it's been an interesting ride. You know, I've had to operate not only as a sales, uh, sales and marketing representative, but as a owner operator in many ways, you know, and that entails a lot of different, uh, skill sets and knowledge. So, it's a, it's a learning curve every day. You know, you got to deal with growers who are our backbone of, you know, our industry. That's where the whole process starts, you mm -hmm. know, to uh, your facility, your, your uh, employees, uh, trucking companies, retail outlets, wholesalers, you know, all, uh, all verticals of, uh, of the supply chain. So that's kind of been my journey um, to date. And it's been, it's been a fun one. It's been a really fun, uh, fun ride so far. And I look forward to hopefully many more years of this, but um, it's an interesting, uh, interesting world that we operate in with the produce uh, supply chain. So I'm interested since you went to Kroger first, is that an intentional, was that an intentional thing? I mean, does your family make you work somewhere else before you work for the uh, company or did you decide to go there first and try to stay out of the family business? Did you do it the opposite of the way Patrick did it or? You know, it was, I never got nudged one way or the other. My parents were always very supportive. If I wanted to be a doctor, they were going to be there for me. If I wanted to be, you know, anything, any other profession, they were all for that. Um, definitely was not kind of a requirement to kind of circle back to the family company. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything along those lines. And to be perfectly honest with you guys, my manager that hired me full time, uh, when I went in for the internship interviews for Kroger to be an inspector for their produce department or their produce uh, buying office, I never heard of Kroger in my life, so I had right, no it's, clue. It's what, Ralph's or um, is it Ralph's in your part of California? Yeah, they've got Ralph's down in Southern California, and like the nearest Ralph's to me is probably, I don't know, two to three hours away, something like that. Yeah. But okay. um, yeah, it's not a household name out here in the Central Valley. We've got a couple other retailers that we know, and that is it. So Kroger was completely foreign to me. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, it's, it's interesting because I come from the Midwest and Dylan's was our mm -hmm. local chain. And then Kroger, like they have so many companies, they bought them. And um, now the stores don't, I don't think the new stores even say Dylan's anymore. They're Kroger branded stores. And then I moved here to the South and it, they are Kroger. The stores are Kroger, I think East of the Act, Mississippi. It's actually Kroger's. We like to add an S. Yes, here that's right. <laughs> Got to go to the Kroger's. Yeah. That's right. So, um, well, that's interesting. So, so what what prompted you to come to the, you know, come to Golden Star after Kroger's Kroger's? <laughs> um, 
I actually had an opportunity. I, I was fishing around a little bit. My plan was to go to work for another citrus company before I circled back home. Um, so I was actually looking for a couple or taking a few job, uh, job offers, you know, looking over things. Some required me to move out of the state, um, you know, just different options. I wasn't sure if I was going to be a Kroger lifelong employee and then, you know, really looking at our family and the dynamic. And this is, I think, a big deal in the ag and the ag uh, business is, you know, I was looking at my dad, you know, he was getting in his, he was in his mid sixties at the time, you know, am I, do I, do I have time to spend time with dad and learn the lessons? If I go and spend three more years working for someone else, or do I bite the bullet, go back and let's just try and figure it out. And I chose, you know, to do that. I actually was offered a promotion there with the Kroger office and just kind of blurted out, I think I'm going to go back home and give it a shot. So that's what happened. And, you know, knock on wood, we've been, we've been, you know, marginally successful, I guess I would say here at Golden Star, but it's been, a, it's been a learning, learning curve over these years. So was there, you know, a lot of times in your career, there is a person or a role or an event that is kind of pivotal. And if you look back on, on your history prior to coming back, or maybe even in your, your recent hit or, or relatively distant past at Golden Star, is there a moment or a, a, an, an interaction or something like that where you've said, you know, this is a life changing moment, or even in retrospect, you recognize now that it was? You know, I, I think that moment when I was offered that promotion was one of the definitely one of those moments that pops up right away. I was really unclear what direction I wanted to head in. I really liked Kroger. I loved working for them. They're a first class operation all mm -hmm. the way. I really liked it there. Um, I really liked the idea of going and trying my hand in sales. So I was really torn at that time. And the last option that was kind of that was really stuck in my head was coming back with Golden Star. So I don't know what prompted me at that point. I couldn't tell you to this day. I just know I was sitting there with my manager and he's talking about these, these you know, this position that they're going to develop with me. And I mean, literally just blurted it out. Like, I think I'm going back home to go and work for the family operation. So I, I don't, I, I still couldn't tell you, but I, I think my head was just, you know, kind of, I was very, I was at a, I was at a fork in the road in, in a couple ways. And um, yeah, I don't regret the decision. I think it was the right decision. And I think overall it's been, it's been a great ride so far. I, I don't know if I would have took another path, how it would have worked out, but um, that's definitely one of the moments that I would say, you know, it kind of the light bulb came on and it was clear that's what I needed to do. Yeah. You can't say why you just knew, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, truly a gut feeling. So I, I, I can't tell you exactly what prompted me for that, but I definitely don't regret the decision. Yeah, clearly. It's always interesting to see how that that's, uh, by the way, that's a really honest answer. Frankly, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you said it that way because I think so often people are looking for meaning in everything or, or they go back and try and analyze it. Somehow you just knew what the right answer was and, and moved on. And I think there's a lot of power in that too. Um, all right. So Patrick, your history is a little bit different, right? I mean, sure. uh, tell us a little bit and you get, you did share a little bit about your career up, up to this point. Love to understand how you got to, you know, the epiphanal moment, if you will, that said, I need to do this thing. Um, and some, maybe some of those pivotal moments that might have driven you this direction, other than, you know, don't share the big blowout that you and dad had or whatever. <laughs> yeah, there, exactly. There, there might've been one of those, but, um, you know, <laughs> only one, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay. You're right. You're right. It was more than one, but you know, it, it's funny because when I went to get a uh, degree, my, my family didn't tell me to get a degree. I'm the only one in my family to have a degree, um, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of it because we were, I worked very hard um, to build my education. And um, I decided to get an entrepreneurship degree. Um, all my, you know, my dad's friends and mentors were, "Oh, you got to go to Fresno State and get an ag science degree, and this is what you got to do." And trust me, Mike's got the degree everybody talks about. It's at Cal Poly. It's at Fresno State. And, and I started to take a different route. I, I took the entrepreneurship degree in my undergrad and then focused on international business and executive leadership in my master's. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, but where's the pivotal moment? So as I'm working uh, for my dad and I'm starting to learn about entrepreneurship and I start learning about uh, the P&Ls, the cash flow statements, operational funds, all these different things, well, my mind starts to ask questions of, hey, how do we run this? 
what do we do in this situation? And uh, dad's all, all response was, do what I tell you to do. Mm-hmm. Let me worry about these things. You are my fruit buyer. You do this. This is your job. You let me handle these things. So as my curiosity kept springing, I started going, well, how much money are we making per load? How much are our processing fees? How much is our freight rates? How much are all these things? Well, as I started getting more curious, dad started just giving me more things to do until it got to a point where I saw myself being capped. So even within my own organization, I I knew I was never going to be president of my family's company. I knew that my brothers who also worked there previously to me, which were already gone at the time, um, they were never going to be as well. And it came to me really sudden. Um, My dad was actually in Las Vegas and I I remember the day it happened. I mean, uh, he was in Las Vegas and I was in Visalia and, um, you know, I made the call to him. He came home right away. I gave him my two weeks notice. There was a lot of other, I would say, uh, arguments in that. Um, But yeah, I gave him a two week notice, uh, finished out the two weeks. And then I would say three weeks later, I started my first business. Uh, with a couple partners in the Central Valley. And that was the pivotal moment when I made that decision. And my partner said, all right, it's a, you want to manage the PL, you want to manage this, here you go, it's yours, start managing it. And then that's where I knew that I couldn't depend on anybody else to give me a paycheck anymore that I had to really fight and hustle every day for whether I'm consulting for someone or whether I am having them as a vendor or a customer. Mm-hmm. Like I just realized Um, that it was all about that entrepreneurship mentality, um, working your butt off in that, you know, the four hour work week, but providing value. And, and that's when it hit me. It was about December of 2009. I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to take this on for myself. And, and I would say since 2009, I've only worked for one person since then over that 11 years for two and a half years. Um, and kind of just been creating my own path. And as my wife said, she's like, uh, everywhere you go, you leave a trail. And I'm like, all right, all right, I get that. You know, all right. But that's kind of that pivotal moment was me finally realizing I had to run my own PL. Hey, so, if I can interject with a quick question. So, you, you and your father, uh, and I don't want to pry, but how does that relationship stand today? Is he, is he proud of everything you've gone on to do? Yeah, my dad's very uh, proud of me. As, as always, my dad is uh, is an immigrant, a very hard worker. As we know, he's, he lives the American dream. He's, I'm very proud of him. Um, but I also think there's a little bit of competition between our Kelly family, as always, uh, between me, my brothers, my dad, even my mom. I think that it's still there. So yes, I think my family is very proud of me. They've told me they're very proud of me. But I definitely think we could definitely put the boxing gloves on and, and uh and go for a round or two. And Mike knows that because he golfs with my family still to this day. Never box with an Irishman. That's a life yeah, lesson that yeah. everyone needs to learn. Or, two, or, two, or three of them. We're all, we're all Canadian Irish. So yeah. welcome, to the, welcome to the club. Um, so uh, interesting, you know, interesting study that. And, you know, the, immediately when I heard that you were being capped, a, a phrase came to mind, only in his own village is a prophet without honor right? I mean, it's really hard to get past being the kid who ran his trike and dented the dented mom's car. It's true. To become the runner of the family. And it's fascinating to see, I think maybe, you know, we haven't learned all the details, but maybe a juxtaposition of the Kelly family versus the Chavez family and, and understand that, you know, that, that different families have different dynamics. Some of them can get past that and some of them can't. I mean, there's always an aspect of that with you right up until the point that your parents become your children. So um, at that point, the dynamic changes pretty, pretty dramatically. But that, I mean, so to me, that's your epiphanal moment, if you, if you think about it from, from that standpoint. But is there anything or anyone else who had an influence on you that helped affirm that decision. Patrick needs to do his own thing or you're able to do it or anything like that. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to have to say it, it was my wife. Um, I've been with my wife since we were 17 years old. So we've been together for almost 20 years now, married for 12. And, you know, she's always been in my corner and, you know, as we all know, our, our wives our, our significant others like to tell us how it really is. And for a long time, she was telling me, Hey, you know, there's an issue that you're not seeing here. 
And so when I decided and said, hey, you know, I'm going to start my own business, my wife didn't say congratulations. She said, it's about time. Like I have been telling you, <laughs> get out of that situation. So, um, you know, my wife's always been in the corner. She, she's the heart and soul of me and my business. And I, without her, I would not be anywhere, anywhere uh, where I am today without her. Yeah. Love That's that. That's great. All right. Are we ready to dive into the produce supply chain? Um, all right. So, so every, as we all know, every supply chain is so different and it's really tough to generalize, but I think to set the table for our listeners that, that maybe they didn't hear the last pod, uh, last podcast episode or they, they haven't listened to any of Patrick's good stuff. Let's just set the table with a generalized, uh, food or produce supply chain. And y'all correct me, please experts, correct me where I've got this wrong. Okay. Uh, so first off sourcing raw materials moving then into production, moving then into processing and packaging, moving into storage, then wholesale distribution, which I know we talked a good bit about in the last episode, right. and then retail distribution to consumers. Is, is at a high level, are those the major nodes of that supply chain? For sure. But ready for this, guys. Now, I'm going to interject here because I did have someone reach out to me about our last podcast, and they said, you missed a step within the supply chain. And I said, wait a minute, are you kidding me? And they said, where does your food safety supply chain start? Mm. They said, we listen to everything, but where do you do start your reporting in this process whether it's to the USDA, uh, the CDFA, she's oh. like, where is this process started? And, and they said, that's where I'm curious about. The, so everything in the supply chain was great, but nothing was about traceability and sustainability and, and recall. And so I, I did have to bring that up that in that supply chain, we do report and process all these pieces of fruit. And, and we could talk about that at a later date. But yes, we track all of this fruit. We talked a little bit about it with the codes on the bins. But that goes into a computer system. Mike knows this, and then that gets reported to our overall numbers within produce. Excellent. How far back does it go? I mean, does it go all the way back to seed or clone sure. or plant or amendment or fertilizer or, I mean, does it include all of that? That's a Mike question. It'll, it'll go all the way back uh, to the uh, grove, so the grower. So the field that the fruit came from. Um, I have seen technology where they can get it back to the tree, allegedly. Wow. I don't know if it's a practical answer, but I think that's the direction we are heading in. So it, it's very interesting with technology and, you know, our traceability and blockchain, you know, where we're heading as an industry. And Scott, you did a great job hitting the supply chain in, in uh, you know, just kind of hitting all the all the points. And I was glad Patrick brought that up because we didn't spend, I don't think we spent any time really talking about food safety on our last talk. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, Scott, that's a great intro. You hit the nails on the head of, uh, you know, in, in general, that is exactly what we're doing. That's the process. I shamelessly stole it from a Google search as I was prepping for this episode. So <laughs> y'all yeah, are, you are the I experts. thought it was notes from the last episode. <laughs> didn't you guys? That's what I thought. I, thought. I, was, I would have bet the farm on that hey, one. Hey, y'all know how, how, uh, entrepreneurs, we look for some shortcuts, and and really, I wanted just to serve it, have that serve as the basis for the for the next part of our discussion, uh, because Greg, we're going to dive into some of the things that might surprise our listeners, right? Yeah, I, and I think it's important to understand that th the dynamics of this industry, not only around food safety, but around perishability, because so many of our so many of our audience, they're in manufacturing of hard goods. And that thing effectively lasts forever, especially when you compare it to an orange or a lemon or a lime or whatever. Um, perishability and, and as we talked about on your show, Patrick, the process of, of um, ripening and the process of preparing and I don't know what to say, dulling up the product for, for, right, for the shelf, um, that's a uniqueness. Um, and probably something that people don't really know a whole lot about either. But so let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of those things in citrus, particularly that are, that are going to surprise some of our listeners. So who wants to surprise them first? Give me your favorite. Yeah. 
Go, well, Michael. You caught me with the with the the you know surprising things. I know we went through the canvas of the supply chain, but oranges are not always orange. So I think that was one thing I know in the last conversation we had, guys, was right. Well, what do you mean? Like we will pick them green or you know somewhat colored with a little bit of orange. Maybe there's 25, 35, 40 percent color of actual natural orange, but we have to treat the oranges when they come in because they will come in green you know, about as green as your grass sometimes. Uh, we put them in sweat rooms. So there's special rooms where we control the atmosphere and humidity or the temperature and humidity. So we control the atmosphere and then we will put uh, ethylene in those rooms. So it's very similar to what they do for bananas, uh, ripening avocados. I know on the uh, stone fruit side, they do this with, with nectarines and peaches, uh, but ethylene's a natural compound. So there's no, uh, nothing funky. It's not, you know, pesticides. Like most people right away, you say anything, any kind of, any kind of application, they figure it's chemical, uh, ethylene's all natural. And we actually turn the pigmentation from a green, you know, green shade, hopefully to a nice bright orange shade. Did so, you say I stone think... fruit, Mike? I was going to yeah, say, stone fruit yeah, stone. explain yeah. that for our audience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, stone fruits, anything that's got a uh, a stone in the middle, so a nice yeah. pit in the middle of it. So yeah. I'm not a stone fruit subject matter expert, so if I offend anyone in that line of work, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I think it's good for our, our audience to know that because I just happened to have, I don't even remember if it was a uh, Google search, but I just happened to have seen an article about stone fruit what they called stone fruit at the time. So that's the only reason I know the difference, but it makes mm. perfect sense, doesn't it? That big old pit, a peach or a pear, or whatever. <laughs> exactly. It, I mean, and believe me, if you've ever been into one, it feels like you've been into a stone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent. So um, we're yeah, still, so is there anything beyond that? I mean, the sweat room and, and that sort of thing, what else jumps out at you that people probably yeah. don't know about? So one thing that's really cool and that our overseas partners probably know more about than the consumers here in America is that there are multiple varieties of a navel orange. Um, and when I mean that, we can start off with a couple, and Mike can probably say a couple more than I am, but we can start off and say a weed, there are a Fukumoto, there is a Washington, there is a Barnesfield. Mike, you want to name three? Ooh, Atwood, Powell, uh, which uh, Fishers, TIs, TI, uh, Thompson Improved. There's, there's, so there's a good chunk. I'm all about right. the TI orange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so how do they, how, uh, the the names for these types of fruit are the names tied to a certain geographic region, like like French wine is, it's, or it's all depending. It could be depending on the grower, right? What the name of the grower was, right? It could be Washington or Fisher. Um, there could be different varieties that are put in and how they're grown. Mm. Um, it's really interesting that you know a navel orange, you know, a Washington will come off at a different part of the season than a Fukumoto where it would, or a Beck orange would. And then some of these oranges, like we know our uh, Korean counterparts, they want that Barnesfield navel. Um, that's a typical navel that comes off between, I would say, February, March, April. And it's believed to have really high bricks in it, really good sugar content in mm. it. And so people try to actually, or consumers will try to say, we want a Barnesfield navel. Hey, is the Fukumoto, when's the Fukumoto going to be out? Now in the industry, we all get that, but the consumer, when they see it in the grocery store, it just says navel on it. It's not going to say Fukumoto. It's not going to say Barnesfield. It's not going to say Beck, but the classifications, you know, that a Beck is elongated, a little bit elongated, more than a Washington would be more round. And then obviously there's, when you look at those varieties, you start to know when a Washington, a Fukumoto, a Beck, um, all these come off throughout the season and you're constantly knowing, well, one, it's just a navel orange, mm -hmm. but there's tons of varieties of navel oranges. And the, and the reason for having all these varieties, I know we talked about it on your show, but I'd love to have you guys share that with the audience. You know, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I don't know if I can even answer that because I know that a lot of the industry we're trying to get away from selling a specific piece of that navel fruit. Like we now tell overseas, hey, it's, it's high bricks fruit. But it's not it could, you Bricks know are... a barns field, but we're like, no, it's not a barns field. So we're getting away from selling that. Mike, what, what is your comment on that? Um, you know what? It, it's back to the names. It's tied to the rootstock. So when they came up with these rootstocks, they um, they um, you know assigned them names, and then really throughout the year, there's uh, 
schedule or a sequence of these varieties. So it goes a layer deeper where, you know, the Fukumoto that uh, Patrick mentioned is one of the earlier varieties that'll come off in October or November. And then Washington's won't start till December or January. And then you'll go into the late season, which is probably, you know, April, May, and June, where you're going to have late lanes and barn fields and specific varieties. So there's a sequence that we work through the season um, based on maturity, flavor profile, you know, readiness or ripeness of the fruit. So there, there's a lot to it. There's definitely a science behind it. And, um, you know, kind of getting back to, you know, we oranges aren't orange, we turn them orange on our side. It's all based around, you know, not only the flavor experience, like Patrick's talking about with like a barn fill being a, uh, a uh, requested variety. Um, I don't know if you gentlemen buy the heirloom navel that you see there, but those are like a Washington uh, rootstock that's, you know, over a hundred years old. And that's the whole sale on them is the flavor profile. Um, you know, you get that nice navel California true signature navel orange eating profile during certain times of the certain times of the year. So it, it's it's a toss up on you know how how things are marketed and you know on our end as a grower and a shipper, we're trying to sell for the consumer to buy with their eyes, but mm. we also have to make sure that there's a nice enough balance that they're going to take that piece of fruit home eat it enjoy it and then come back to buy mm. you know more product that that's our bread and butter is repeat sales on the retail side which i learned with kroger as well as the shipper side we want to make sure that they want to come back and buy that golden star you know signature flavor uh brand of oranges between you know our citrus season love it hey let me um so i want y'all to define bricks greg you had the right thought there because i want to understand what that is but one of my key takeaways and this is gonna be an obvious one but I'm, I'm, I can be really slow sometimes. From that first episode, one of my great key takeaways was y'all, bo both of y'all really emphasized how quality is so paramount. And, 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 you know, on its face, everyone can agree with that. But when you really start to think about, you know, consumers in stores as they're selecting fruit, I mean, they're, perhaps that's the most inspected thing of anything you buy in a grocery store. And it really, I really like how y'all brought that home because uh, Michael, just as you shared there, it's about that, that uh, consumption experience. And it's so, it seems to be so unique for, for this industry, huh? Oh, absolutely. And there, you know, there's a couple approaches and this is one of the things that I felt like I learned, you know, right after college was, you know, going on the buying side, then hopping over to the sales side, you know, there's two approaches here. It's first to market you know, where, okay, if we have a, if we have a, a deficit or a, a, of supply, let's say with oranges, you know, of course there's going to be a lot of demand. There's, there's plenty to go around. The problem that I see is if we start too early and there are a, there is a um, requirement, the California requirement for flavor in order for us to even start our season, we have to meet a minimum quality um, of bricks and sugar acid ratio kind of, uh, kind of algorithm in mm -hmm. order to even start our season. And, you know, getting back to, you know, the flavor profile, if you walk in, grab a four pound bag of oranges in, you know, late October and you take it home and it tastes more like a lemon than an orange, you're probably not coming back to buy another bag the next week when you make your next trip. So it is, uh, you know, I like to, what you said, it's absolutely paramount that we, uh, we uh, have a eating profile that's going to entice consumers for the repeat business. Well, paramount with a P-E-A-R maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> sorry guys no. had to do it all right greg let's keep Too driving for dad jokes man <laughs> <laughs> I knew uh, hey, but that, that, that's that's even better than i think you guys saw on linkedin the other day someone said hey you know dracula's favorite fruit is a neck terrine oh boy <laughs> i like that one yeah. oh, we can keep this up for a while do we <laughs> no please don't <laughs> <laughs> greg, greg's greg's had enough That's right. greg, always greg off already he's like it's been an hour get me out of here <laughs> guys oh uh, yeah bricks, I, I think it, right I think no go ahead scott well bricks so, so just yeah, define bricks, right? what bricks is Brick. So Bricks technically, and I'm thinking back to Fresno State, I remember taking a quality assurance uh, class. Bricks is not technically sugar. Bricks is particles, I believe, that get picked up and we correlate that to sugar content in the juice. Oh, got it. Okay. So we'll do tests on a refractometer 
which is a little, it's a, it's some, some of them are little tools and some of them are actually press tools that you could use. And then uh, Mike, you might have one, um, but Got one right here. yeah, so you'll take, you'll squeeze the juice into the tiny little uh, bowl, you know, bowl. Right um, in there. It then will measure your temperature of the internal pulp of the fruit. It will then also measure like a sugar acid ratio. You take that number and then you're going to times that by your bricks and you're going to get an actual sugar acid ratio. So then, like I said, you can then tell a consumer, Hey, the acid is here or, or below here. And a lot of times, like I said, in a lemon, you want to have acid less than, you know, 1.01 .01 or so. Um, that way you have some really good lemons, not too tangy, but just good enough, you know, to make lemonade or things like that. So there's a lot of different factors that come into that. And customers request that also. Really? Oh, yeah. We have You've got a lot smarter customers than I am. I can assure <laughs> now, you. I can tell you Mike's favorite thing to do, and he's going to laugh right now, is making quality reports. Oh His boy, you gotta love thing, quality guys. reports. Quality favorite reports and pictures. <laughs> oh man, I love doing those. I hope none of my customers are watching this right now. <laughs> I'm saying it with a smile. <laughs> yeah. love quality Keep reports. smiling, Michael. Well, oh, you know, we wanted this segment to surprise listeners. I can't guarantee that it surprised the listeners, but it sure surprised me. I mean, a refractometer, is that is that what you said? Yes, sir. Yep. Um bricks, stone fruit, um, all of these different flavor profiles and, and breeds. Um, so quick question on that. Are any of these relocated from other areas? Because it used to be there, it used to be, there was orange season, right? You only got oranges during a certain season. Did we relocate plants from south of the equator to north of the equator? Or did we or did we breed plants to get them to blo uh, bloom, to, to ripen throughout the year? Is that too much of a history question? I think there's both. I, think there's both. I mean, you've got greenhouses in, in Texas that are growing grapefruit year round. That is actual Texas grapefruit being grown in greenhouses. Um, and then you've got imports. So yeah, when navels are gone or, or out of season in California, 100% that we switch to the import season and start bringing in navels from South Africa uh, Australia, New Zealand. Um, we start bringing in mandarins from Spain, Morocco. Um, but no, I, I would say I don't, there's not a year round uh, supply of California navels, right? Because of the seasonality, but there is a year round supply of navels uh, through other organizations and companies and growers throughout the, uh, the globe. And of course, all these flavor profiles and things you're talking about, that's for consumed citrus, not juice. Because is, is it true that the juice is a blend of, tell us the truth about juice. Yeah, you know what? I mean, listen, I've worked in the juice industry a long time and you know, people could bite me or try to cut my head off, but it, it all depends on the flavor profile and what they're doing at the time. Um, juice can be held sometimes up to three years in the drums, right? Like if there's a freeze or, and if the, if the navel is really debittered, then yeah, they're gonna take that and blend that with some mandarin juice, right? They're gonna, they can only blend up to so much, right? Per the, uh, the laws, right? I don't know anymore. I'm not in that game as much as I used to be, but I believe it was like less than 10%. You were allowed to blend of different juices or any mix to be able to, you know, get that the bitter taste out of your mouth. Right. So yeah, they do blend. Um, a lot of Brazilian tankers come into Florida and Brazilian comes in. So they'll blend with Florida. Uh, they'll blend with California. I've, I've sold California citrus juice tankers to Florida, bought Florida for California. So so yeah, and it all depends on your customers though. I mean, if someone's saying it's 100% Florida orange juice, I doubt they're gonna have a blend in there. If you're selling it to a school, right, in the little juice boxes, you probably have a little bit more leniency and you can put tropical juice mix in there with orange juice, right? There's different levels of customers um, and different levels of packaging and what you, can, what you can do, right? Hence why quality is so important. So, um, so our audience is clear. What we are talking about is we're talking about the fruit you buy off the shelf at Kroger or Publix or wherever, right? Um, yeah, fresh, fresh product, yes. Right. Yeah, we're talking about the right. fresh, exactly. So the juice is completely different, exactly, completely. Yeah. So, Michael, let's talk a little bit about the traceability you alluded to before. You actually use the word blockchain in regard to citrus. And I know when we were on Patrick's show, we talked a little bit about that as well. So tell us a little bit about some of the 
innovations or evolutions in terms of track and traceability in, in the industry? Yeah, uh, our traceability plan here with Golden Star is, you know, any grower, any lot that we pick, we identify with a lot code. That lot code, once we run and uh, size and wash and wax and do all the fun stuff we do with the oranges to get them in a box or a bag, you know, follows the fruit the whole way across. So if it was in a bin and ID is blocked uh, ABC123, when it goes into a carton uh, or a bag into a, into a carton, you know, that sticker that's going to be on there is going to have the date that we packed it and ran that fruit when it was packaged and then that ABC123 lot on it. So we'll be able to trace it all the way through from there to the BOL. So the bill of lading, once it leaves our, our uh, facility, which, you know, the carrier takes over uh, and then up until it's received to our end customer, whether it's a retail outlet or a wholesaler, that ABC123 lot is going to stick with that fruit the entire way. So, you know, uh, heaven forbid anything, you know, happen and we have to do a recall, we'd be able to pull those lot codes where they were shipped to, which customers and destinations, and then issue a recall at that point. So we, we can pinpoint everything back to, you know, okay, it was that lot, which means it was this grower, we're going to have to investigate, you know, from start to finish, you know, what could have potentially happened here. And that's the predominant reason for the use of the blockchain, right? Is to be able to verify the handoffs and the original sourcing. Is that? Absolutely. And I mean, within our, within our operation, I know every operation uh, is a little different on their protocol. Um, some are definitely using a lot more technology that's more advanced. Um, there's, I believe Patrick was talking to me about a company that follows product that's imported through cargo ships on the, on boats and you can see in real time if i'm correct um where the product is who who it's which facility it's at if it's on a truck if it's in a facility or anything i think patrick can speak a little more uh, about that but it was very impressive the uh, the the uh, blockchain technology that uh, the company that uh, he was talking to brought forward very interesting stuff I just recall that when we were, when we did the previous show, you just spoke about blockchain so matter of factly. And even in what I think most people would say arguably are really sophisticated supply chain businesses, blockchain is a much, much bigger deal. It seems like a heavier lift than, than the way you presented it, but it's just such a necessity for the nature of your business that how long have you been using blockchain? Oh, we've started what two, three years ago. Um, and really before we just, it was always the food safety traceability. So that's really where it kicked off. And we've been doing that for probably 12 years now. I think I was at Fresno state when I kicked that into gear here with golden star. But, um, I mean, I saw the writing on the wall back then and I go, you know what, we need to get on board with implementing this to a small degree and then really blow it out through the whole operation. Cause it, it's not going away. There's no way it, it's going to go anywhere. You know, if we want to stay in business, we got to adapt this into our, into our operation. You Next know, the person that asked me, what is a, what is, what do we use blockchain for? I'm sending them to you, Michael. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I should thank you or uh, change <laughs> yeah, number. Right. Point. It's going to be, it's going to be like quality reports. Oh, he sent me another one. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Let's start from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Patrick, you want you sound off. Well, you know, what's interesting is that back in 2010, 2012, I was a, I was a complete broker at the time. And, and Michael knows this and if our listeners don't, but when you're a broker, you got to use all the audits and, and protocols from the packing houses that you're buying and selling from. And, you know, that was interesting to me. So as a broker, I remember my brother and I, we were sitting around one day and we were selling to processors and my brother and I said, we should develop our own recall protocol. And I remember um, we were like, but why? No one cares about a broker. They're just going to go right to the, uh, the grower anyways if something happens. But what we did was we created our own broker recall protocol which the same thing with like CO2 emissions. If you can show your customer that you're you know, reducing CO2 emissions when delivering to them, if you're reducing you know, your carbon footprint, all these different things, then the customers are going to see that as an added value. So to Mike's point too, 
the blockchain, you know, has really started getting big over the last, you know, few years, but the industry has done it in a different way, whether it was a Julian code, whether it was a lot number, uh, whatever it might be. Now we're just incorporating a lot more technology into this. So when that fruit goes through the sizer gets tagged with a sticker, a PLU that's running into the computer system. It's then making charts for us. It's making graphs for us, showing what lots they come from. That goes into our recall protocol that shows, okay, this went from uh, lot A to lot B to lot C to customer X, Y, Z. And we follow it through the entire supply chain, which as Mike always knows, he's got no ugly babies, right, Mike? And when those babies go out, right, and we get a, hey, we're, we're rejecting, right? The biggest things we don't want to hear in the produce industry is we're rejecting a load. And that's where we start the process is going, okay, where did the cold chain get broken? Um, mm -hmm. Was there a break in the cold chain? Uh, what grower did that come? Did we spray on that one? Uh, did that have, let's check the defects of that grow. Maybe there was clear rot. Maybe there was brown rot. Maybe we had some issues when we were packing, but that's realistically how it goes. So um, that is seen as a lot of value in our industry, but more companies are making the technology to trace all this for you and making it a little bit easier. So you as the grower don't have to. But in the world of Mike and Golden Star Citrus, like you said, he's been having to track this stuff since day one just to have his USDA global gap audits and everything else to be um, a grower, packer, shipper in this industry. Right. Right. So, okay. Uh, we talked about day one. We talked about your early stage. We've talked about some of the developments that you've seen. I think the biggest development that we need to talk about in, in terms of the industry is the one we have to go to. Uh, I'm interested, and I think our audience is interested in how has COVID-19 and this seismic societal disruption, how has that impacted um, operations, the industry as a whole, uh, you know, production, transportation, any of that? You know, it's crazy. And I'll talk first just because I, I talk to a lot of people on the podcast. So I get a lot of different views from um, uh, wholesalers, growers, shippers, importers, um, and it's affecting everybody differently. Uh, one thing I can tell you is some people, if you've listened to the podcast, they're saying it's the best it's ever been. I mean, they're sitting here saying it's fantastic. Things are great. And then you got people on the other side of saying, you know, they were so hit by it because they did have maybe have their eggs in one basket with food service or certain mm -hmm. customers. And that's what we've seen out there. Operations a hundred percent. I mean, uh, Labor is having challenges, as like we've talked about uh, in the previous episode. Um, people are having challenges. I'm going to be visiting a food bank locally in Tampa here, and they're working three days off or three days on, two days off, doing split schedules between their employees. So yeah, there's been a lot of disruptions within the produce and supply chain industry. But what I will tell you, Greg, uh, Scott, you guys know this: our frontline workers within the produce and supply chain industry have made this happen. So there's been a lot of faults, but our people have really stepped up during this pandemic and made it a success for a lot of companies. Whether your company is doing bad, our employees and our people are showing up every day to make us successful, and we appreciate that. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, is that, Michael, have you, have you guys continued to plant and pick and harvest and cultivate through this whole thing? Yeah, one of the biggest things is, you know, with uh, with COVID, um, you know, showing up and, you know, us uh, trying to get used to a new normal, I think it's been a big uh, spotlight on our industry and those involved of how, uh, how resilient we are. It's definitely been a challenge. And like Patrick mentioned, um, for some items, you know, we're seeing a lot of movement. You can't make enough of it. You can't sell sell fruit quick enough. You can't make it fast enough. You know, there, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, reservoir of, of supply at all at any, you know, supermarket or, or, you know, anywhere that's selling fresh groceries, you know, and I think that really, uh, is focused in on us in the citrus world, uh, for the simple fact of, Hey, we want to get our immune systems as strong as possible right now. Mm. Well, let's go grab some vitamin C, you know, let's get some oranges, let's get some grapefruit. Let's try and incorporate this into our diet. So I know we talked last time, you know, I've had some customers go two, 300%, you know, above what we did, you know, the fiscal year prior. So it's, it's been absolutely insane. And, you know, with citrus and I know a few other items in the fruit and veg department, very heavy to manual labor. So, you know, the, uh, the uh, contract labor that we use out there to pick our oranges, you know, if you have a crew of 20, 25 pickers and one of them tests positive, 
for COVID, you lose all 25 of those pickers. So yeah. you, uh, you quickly can backslide and, and, you know, that's, it's not easy. Labor has been a challenge within our industry, but you know, COVID has affected us in so many ways. You know, we don't, we don't actually um, employ the uh, directly employ the manual labor pickers. We don't directly employ the trucking companies. So you have all these hands in the middle that, you know, as, as soon as someone tests positive or their wife or family member somewhere they're around, they're immediately going into quarantine. You're losing them for 10 to 14 days. So yeah. it's it's been a big shift. But, um, you know, like Patrick alluded to, you know, there's been ups and downs. I think bottom line is, you know, everyone along the supply chain has done a great job of being resilient and tough. You know, I think we've shown what a tough industry we are. And, you know, this uh, food supply chain, you know, it has not cracked, you know, it, it's definitely bent, but it has not cracked. So I'm very proud to be part of that. You know, and I, I have to interject, Scott, I'm going to bring back, this is a previous episode of Supply Chain Now that I watched probably a few months ago. Um, and I told this to Michael, this was so funny. Before we even met, I told this, this uh, to Michael and Scott said, you know, do you realize that the produce and supply chain industry, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, has more money and volume than the, I believe is the, the sports industry. Do you remember you saying that, Scott? And you were saying that, that if you took all the money and what we're doing in the produce and supply chain industry, that it almost beats that. And I, I say that because this produce and supply chain industry, as, as much as uh, we love our sports, right? It's like we're, we, we are compared to different organizations, different industries. And as we've seen all these other industries be so resilient and do the things they've done, that's what we're doing now. We're being able to step up to the plate, be there for America like we've always had, be here for the globe. We're feeding the globe right now, right? right. And so those are things that I always think is so funny because as an industry, people don't really understand how big the produce and supply chain industry really is. Yeah, I, I think I think what you're referring to was um, we found some statistics that said if supply chain was a sport, yes, it would be that's what I it like was. the third largest sport in the world. There you go. Thank right? you. It was something right. like that. I, I, it's funny. I had to dig deep for that, but yeah, but I do recall true. that. It was, but, but, it, but right, I, it is. I mean, it is. That. Yeah, I mean, it's a substantial part of business. We just talked to somebody just before we came on with you that said supply chain is the business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, that's, you know, that's maybe a broad, bold statement, but if you think about it, it doesn't matter, Michael, if you're growing oranges, if you can't get them to anybody, right? Right. No product, no program as our dear friend, Dominique, uh, as we said, yeah. yeah, but you know, you're right. And, and I really admire both of your passion, both Patrick and Michael, cause we share it with you that, um, despite all the technology that exists in global supply chain and these different sectors and industry, and despite all the gains and, and, and how we're moving fast forward and, and accelerate and with change and advancement and continuous improvement every day, innovation in particular, still the people that make it happen from the, the, the produce fields to our factories and our warehouses, our fulfillment centers, especially in this day and age of e-commerce, all these hardworking people that, that to your point, for the most part, they have not missed a beat. I mean, yeah, we've had a plant shut down here and a shut down here as they look to contain some of these micro you know, outbreaks that's going to happen. But, but to your, I completely agree with you. The people of our global supply chain has really protected the psyche of, of not just folks here in the States, but globally. And it's really, it's, 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 it has, um, I can't say enough about it because I, I know all of y'all, I've, I've worked in factories, rubbed elbows with some of the hardest working people the brightest people that solve problems day in and day out and they don't get any attention. And it's such a shame. So I, 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 I share y'all's passion for the workforce. And I know Greg does too, because you can't level those folks enough. Supply chain is a thankless job. Oh, hundred percent. We're, we're all thankful for that, for people that do that thankless job. Right. right. Amen. You know, an old, an old uh, wise man, wise guy that I once worked with said, if you're, if you're overstocked, you're in trouble and it's your fault. If you're out of stock, you're in trouble and it's your fault. And if something happens to go wrong and everything or happens to go right and everything happens just the way it is, thank God for those salespeople. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah. So as we start to wrap up here, um, let's, let's pick one thing 
that as we go broad, right? Go broad, think global business, global supply chain. What's one thing, whether it's a, a news story or development or innovation or, or just a, a topic you know, in the business, what's one thing that y'all are tracking more than others? And Mike, let's start with you. Uh, the big uh, item or hot, uh, hot uh, subject for me right now is direct to consumer. You know, we've seen what Amazon, you know, some of these big players have done with direct to consumer. Um, I'm actually working on a project with different models to uh, test that within, you know, our fresh produce industry. So that's a big one for me. Um, I'm guessing Patrick's probably going to, you know, shoot out the same answer as myself. I know we talk about it. It feels like 24 seven, but uh, you know, I mean, that's a challenge. I go, and it's not just a challenge for me personally, you know, this, uh, this uh, COVID-19 has really challenged us in every way where we're having to pivot. We're having to figure out, you know, here's the problem. We know that. How do we come up with the solution? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been analyzing a lot of, uh, a lot of information on direct to consumer within, you know, my operation outside. I mean, just looking as an industry in general. So that's, that's a big hot, hot uh, subject for me right now. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great uh, angle. That's not one that was really in my, between my ears, Greg. So poignant. And it goes right back to the, discussion we had on Patrick's show, and that is, I think you, you uh, told us an anecdote, anecdote about a few people who have contacted you and said, hey, how do I, did I get Golden Star produce, right? And, and you said, I can't guarantee that because it, you know, it's, <laughs> it's packaged by, by Costco or, or Kroger or whoever the, the retailer is, but I could see just like you said, if the flavor profile works and it's what they want, why the would you not go all the way back to the grower? I mean, it's the reason that in, in caveman days or whatever, you went back to that very tree for that orange or, or, you know, in, in, if you, if you think about farmer's markets, you, you go back to that booth, to that farmer to get their oranges, right? I mean, this is, the world is just a big giant farmer's market now. And if you and if you have an affinity for a particular brand, go get it. It's brilliant. Put, that is really brilliant, Mike. I, I like that that caveman visual that you just painted I, in I my had head. It. I had it in my mind. I had me <laughs> going to the same tree, grabbing. I'm like, is that pear ready yet? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, Patrick, what's what's your one thing that you're tracking more than others here right now? You know, I'm going to be real here. Um, I'm going to piggyback of direct to consumer, obviously, but I'm going to go more into a leadership. Listen, empathy, empathy, empathy right now is what I'm not seeing. Um, everybody's getting bashed for their own opinions, um, whether it's in a political statement, whether it's just in operations. It's like every, no one can have an opinion every, anymore. It's like before it was like, oh, yeah, you know, opinions like this. You know, I'm going to say you guys all know the phrase, what it opinions like. Um, but I think. Belly button. Right. The ability to understand and share the feelings of others during this time is I, I, have, I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I have, but people are lacking that because of the social distancing and what we're doing. And I believe as we move forward, this is going to be a new world we're teaching our kids. Uh, we all have kids on this call and that we're teaching our kids to work from home now, right? At the age yeah. of five years old, we're teaching them all these things, but we're expecting so much of them. Yeah. So as you look to these cross generations and you see from the Gen Z all the way through to the baby boomers, we have five living, breathing, working generations in the workforce today. Everybody's going to have a different culture, different background, a diverse culture, could be from another country. We need to have empathy and we really need to embrace these new cultures uh, that's happening today. And I am starting to see that in companies, but I haven't seen enough. And I really hope that uh, we as people gain more empathy and get past this 2020. Well said. Well said. Bravo. I'd give you a standing applause because we need so much more empathy. And that's the kind of the core of your message there, understanding. But you know what? So you, your tools of the trade. Mike, you showed us the refractometer. I think I got that right. <laughs> I've, got, <laughs> I've got a jerky meter, and it's been going off the walls here lately. So to our, don't be a jerk, you know? Put yeah. yourself in other people's shoes and walk in them for a little while, right? I mean, we, we, need, we need so much more of that, especially in the challenging year that is 2020 where folks are struggling in different ways. You may not see it. You may have no, have no idea, but uh, we just we got to double down on that. So – Greg, I know you want to go ahead. Seek first to understand. 
everyone should read the seven habits of highly effective people. Ah. Every single person on the planet <laughs> should read it, right? A book that starts with what you want said at your funeral about you. Yep. That, if everyone looked at life that way, or as I think I said on another one of our shows, just pretend your grandmother is right there beside you every single thing you say and do you will be a lot better person because who wants to who wants oh, to let their grandma down right gosh if you met my grandmother oh man <laughs> well this has been a great uh, really enjoyed the first episode i've really enjoyed this one uh, i really appreciate how down to earth and just um how tr how um frank you are and what you're sharing and and of course your your expertise in the world of produce and supply chain it comes out um uh, as, as a gold star it, gleaming as as mike oh, started in front of this oh, look at that he's been Golden waiting the whole star. show to do that i'm just curious is he, like is he pulling this stuff off of like one two like uh <laughs> com, or is he actually writing this stuff down now i mean i'm loving uh, it you know we, we, we prep a little bit around here but um <laughs> No, really, and I really appreciate where y'all come from. Appreciate yeah. the passion and the expertise in the industry. Let's make sure our listeners know how to connect with y'all and your respective organizations. And Mike, let's start with you. Uh, real simple. Go to our website, www.goldenstarcitrus.com. You can check out uh, our product offerings, contact us, learn a little about us. Awesome. Perfect. It's just that simple. All right, Patrick. Yeah, I'm going to be a little more complicated. I actually got to plug in, you know, with Greg here. Um, also, if you want to learn about the generations, you got to get my book, Millennial Boom, that talks all things about the generations that thrive in life and work. And there's a couple of produce stories in there as well. I mentioned that because you can, you can reach me at the produceindustrypodcast.com under our messages, but you could also check out millennialboomnow.com. Um, which you'll find my book with I co-authored with Hans Finzel that gives, like I said, a little life and times of millennials, boomers, Gen Xers, and the uh, new Gen Z coming up along with some fun produce stories. Um, and also at thepatrickkelly.com, anywhere on any social media, you can find me at thepatrickkelly or thepatrickkelly85. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Greg, what another, another great episode with these two, right? These two cats were literally born to do this. Mm. I mean, they grew up in families that did what they're doing. And, you know, we see that so frequently, right? I mean, Patrick's Irish. I think he should have been a cop, but somehow they got into the citrus industry, <laughs> grossly generalizing there. But, um, but you know, the, I, I think it, it's interesting to see how much of an impact, whether you wind up with the family business like Michael did or not in the family business, what an incredible influence discussions over the dinner table are discussions around home and, and, and family relationships are in shaping who you become and what you do for a living. That's, yeah. that's it can't be, uh, and you know, Patrick just talked about that. It cannot be overemphasized the impact that you have on your children. Mine are fully baked, not, when I say fully baked, I mean fully grown, um, but that <laughs> we're not in California. Um, but they, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you, you know, the, the, you can see the little things and, and when they get old enough, they tell you about the little things where you think they weren't listening mm. and how that dramatically influenced their lives, right? Yeah. So every little thing matters. And yes. that's an important lesson as people are spending so much time with their kids at home. Yes. And a great song. We started the warm up show about songs and you heard that's right actually you heard some of patrick and greg singing if you happen to be with us oh before we gosh, went live but uh all right so and and the thing that stood out for me both patrick and mike are trailblazers and pioneers i mean i mean patrick with the first uh, to focus on the produce industry as a podcast right? right and we've seen the numbers take off we've seen the interest and demand in that and then uh mike a couple different ways but blockchain in particular I mean, there's, there's so many organizations struggling to figure out how to do it. And, and yes, Mike's been doing it a couple of years now. That's that Just is a so matter of fact, right? right. Yeah. Early adopter, early adopter. So yeah. a lot of good stuff. Uh, big thanks to Michael Chavez and Patrick Kelly. Uh, look forward to doing this again really soon. Uh, we'll make sure to have your, um, your, your social links and your website and all in the show notes to make it easy for our audience to plug in. 
Uh, and Greg, that's going to just about wrap up this episode of Supply Chain Now, right? Yeah, I guess that I guess that's got to be it. But um, <laughs> look, we learned a lot here, um, and I would encourage you to go to the Produce Industry Podcast and listen up, and also get yourself some of that Golden Star Produce. I'm really looking for. Actually, Michael, we should talk offline because there are companies that are specifically focused on helping brands like yours get into D to C. So mm. um, we can touch base on that, but I'm really looking forward to those days coming. And it's funny that direct to consumer is quite the topic these mm. days. Uh, I'm going to go eat go orange. The source, man. <laughs> right. Y- y'all got, y'all got me craving some navel oranges right now. And that's what, that's going to be what, what I'm going to do when we wrap up this interview. But on that note, on behalf of Greg White, on behalf of our whole supply chain now team here, Hey, do good give forward and be the change that's needed. Take a page out of Patrick's book. Uh, And with that in mind, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.